So next up, I want to talk a little bit about the differences for you peeps when it comes to like TV series, to features, to documentaries, and what that kind of looks like. I know you both did a lot of different documentary work starting out and hopped around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. What does it look like? And obviously, I it's very dependent on what your role is probably going to be in sound department, but what are some of the considerations when you're saying, oh, it's gonna be a documentary versus maybe a TV series? Is there something that you start to prep out? Maybe for production sound, we can start there, and then post-production sure. sound, we can go to you. Okay, well, if they say it's gonna be a documentary, it means I'm, my body's gonna hurt because I'm gonna be booming <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna have a heavy <laughs> heavy recorder and, and, and wireless around me, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, it's run and gun. Yeah. Where, where, whereas um, a feature, most features at least, um, are going to be cart based. Same thing with most TV shows. And, um, you know, depending on if you're doing episodic, uh, hour long episodic versus um, a sitcom um, or single camera, your cart could look very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about for post? Um, I would say there's a different style oftentimes, uh, project to project, based on the genre of project. Um, but I would also say that I've mixed some documentaries, like scripted, mm -hmm. and I've mixed some scripted in a verite, more documentary style. I've mixed, um, I, I once had a one hour episodic that actually had a multi-cam section and then it went single cam. That was interesting. That's cool. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, it was called um, Ryan Hansen Solves Crime on Television. It's a very interesting show. Uh, so, but um, where can I find this? Uh, it's it was on YouTube Red when they started their own like individual studio. Oh, so you cool. can, yeah you can try. It's actually really cool. Um, but yeah, the front and the back half are live studio audience multicam, and then the middle is single cam and even different color treatment. Um, but yeah, there's different That's compression styles, different music styles. Um, I have done half hour comedies. I've done sitcom -y things. Um, I, I mix New Girl. I mix Single Parents. I mean, uh, lovely, fun, fun shows. Mm -hmm. um, but even Single Parents, we decided to take a more uh, almost scripted drama, like drama approach versus a sitcom approach, whereas New Girl was a little bit more compressed and a little bit brighter. Uh, a little bit punchier, um, that, and that has to deal with the uh, compression settings and music level settings and background settings and depth of detail and backgrounds and foley, mm -hmm. et cetera. It's all a slightly different style based on genre. Um, I like switching between some styles. Um, some people like perfecting one specific thing. Mm -hmm. I, I find that like I, I'm actually a funnier comic mixer after I've done horror because like what makes something scary is missing the beat and surprising you but what makes something funny is hitting the beat so being present with what the beat is and when to follow the convention and when to shake it up can sometimes be a good tool to have so I like kind of I agree with that yeah. you know I like yeah. kind of mixing genres um, but yeah, there's definitely different mixing styles and different tool sets, 100%. And, yeah. and workflows, of course, like documentary being the most obvious in the sense that there's going to be no ADR. There might be narration. There's going to be absolutely no Foley unless there's recreation. Um, there's going to be, right? <laughs> you know, or, or something subjective or something, yeah. you know, something artsy or subjective. Um, but yeah. I broke the rule on that a couple yeah, years yeah, ago I, on something I, else. I did, I did, did something for the Navy that was like that. Yeah. Daco, and we did a lot of Foley. Yeah, <laughs> We yeah, had so. to fill it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. But, but but you know, for the most part, there's less ingredients to mm -hmm. it, to a doc, uh, and it's more verite mixing. It's right. more it's more triage. Yeah, that's true. It, it also depends on how good the production sound was. Truth. If you're trying to Truth. recreate stuff. <laughs> <laughs> true. True words. True words. <laughs> I love how passionately both of you talk about the creative and the theoretical aspects of sound, which there is a lot to consider just from the tools that you're using during production, how that sound comes to you and what you have to work with to manipulate it in the favor of whatever style you're going with. And how closely does that look like when say you're working with like the director? Are you guys actively talking to the director through a lot of this process? Is that something that you see a lot on production? Uh, I'll bring it up at times. If, mm -hmm. if, if I need to, but yeah. we usually talk about it in pre-production. But for for instance, um, we we I'll, I'll I'll go back to Modern Family. We did a special episode, which is one of my favorites actually, um, that was shot kind of live, and it was um, called Connection Lost. It was a bunch of FaceTime, um, and it was before you had Zoom, so 
if you know the show, Claire was mm-hmm. um, stuck at the airport, and then she's FaceTime calls to Phil. They're looking for Haley. So we did it live, though, and basically I had four different sets going on at the same time. So um, the, the, the question was, when I, when, I, when I read it, was like, how should this sound? Well, it should sound open. It should sound like it's on a boom. It shouldn't be on wires. Mm-hmm. So I did everything I could to not use the wires. We wired everybody as a, as a backup, right? Mm-hmm. But um, I had booms, two booms on each set, except for with Claire. She was w- one boom. And then I had different um, comms so Claire could hear everybody else but not herself. Mm-hmm. And that went on to the other, other sets. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were able to quickly talk and banter and it really really worked that's for really the performances cool. yeah so so that's a good example of like answering that question how should this sound okay this is how we implement it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but if if your producers were in my case were really on board mm-hmm. they said we'll give you whatever you need to pull this off so you know i had an eight person um sound department which is very unusual Mm -hmm. is that rather large it's huge yeah usually it's a three-person crew and during covid you have you know a fourth person because you know um there's two boom operators on set and then a a utility that's that's usually wiring somebody Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um in i my question for sound is the thought process when you're not going into a specific scenario like that where you have to consider the device is it typical the strategy is just to get the best sound possible to be able to then pass in a post right and that's where maybe like more tweaks would happen or do you try to set it up like for say in camera if you're shooting on film you want to bake in the look is it best practice to try to give you the most amount of like bandwidth to be able to ma- manipulate it in post um and then it's just obviously i know some of it's circumstantial yes yeah. but if it's a Depends. period piece yeah. from from you know the 70s or 80s let's say mm-hmm. um I'd want to go with the microphones that were a little used more of a back then. Sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Or, or if you know, on a basic level, if I have somebody in front of a podium, mm-hmm. um, I don't necessarily want to use the wire the whole time. Sure. I want to give that track of the person in front of the the, the podium so I can hear that plosive. Right. Right. If 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 you need to, I mean, it's it's a nice mm-hmm. texture, and that's how it should be. Right. And also on, on, on dramas that are a little bit more atmospheric or sound effects driven, um, I find that one of the effective things that I do with the material that comes from production is I really, uh, I, I don't want to make things sound super chesty or super close. Um, so for things like um, Project Blue Book or For All Mankind or, or Outlander or uh, for those kind of big dramas, big, big dramatic uh, pieces, it, it's really, really effective to um, have both the boom and the lav and use the wide natural space of the boom. And then when you're in a more intimate environment and you're using that audio rack focus to really go in detail for an intimate moment to move closer in using mm-hmm. the lav and pull that space out, you can't do that unless you have both of those things. You can't do that. Right. That, that is only utilized from having that material. And, and more and more over the fa- last few, last yeah. few years, yeah. you're actually getting it double cut for That's you. That's true. That's true. Mm-hmm. The, that wasn't um, always the case. Yeah, Audible Line <laughs> has changed my world. Yeah. Um, and what is that? Um, it is a, um, well, I mean, it, it's a software that does a particular purpose, but many softwares do this purpose. I shouldn't endorse one particular. In fact, ABDX has a, a lovely tool within it as well. And um, but basically, it it takes the boom and lav mic, which oftentimes um, there you know the production mixers are able to make a general calculation for an offset of. Uh, delay between the two, like that would cause a phasing. But on a moving mic, it's going to change. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So the, basically, the software allows you to kind of make that adjustment as it rolls. So it, it will take oh, away cool. that proximity movement and, and help you get those in alignment. And as soon as you do that, all that kind of phasiness that you hear in a natural, regular mix track goes away. Things become very crystal, very clear. Um, and then it's very easy to take a natural space. And I, I always put a little bit of room verb just because everything 
when you listen to an individual, absolutely, does. that you there is a space. You're not just listening from. <laughs> it's not just my mouth to your ears. There's the space that it's going. Mm-hmm. You know, the air that's going through the walls, et cetera. So I always add a little bit of that, but being able to. Uh, dramatically choose when to utilize a mic that encompasses that space and enhances it versus a mic that really enhances uh, an on-axis close proximity sound is is a dramatic tool. Yeah, yeah. that's really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of information there. Now, that's really great. And it seems like <laughs> to be able to have all of these different tools to maybe be able to make the creative choices I love the idea for like authenticity, like you were talking about at the podium, having the select mic, that's gonna be what we wanna have the audience be able to tap into. Because the audience, I mean, for me, sound, from sound design to obviously score, that's some of the, like you were saying, that's the soul of the movie, and people mm-hmm. feel that. And it's great to know, like for those that are considering sound, there is a lot of creativity. Don't look at it as something, you know, and. I've always noticed that, but I feel like sound doesn't always get the spotlight that it does deserve in terms of like the creative level that you're able to do. Look, if it's yeah. good, nobody notices. That's yeah. right. We're subconscious influence. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. that's a great way of saying that. Yeah, <laughs> very subconscious. And the question that I have for you, Carol, mm-hmm. is what does that creative process look like? Are you with the director a lot or how does that look? It really depends on the director. It really mm-hmm. depends on the filmmakers. Um, how do they like to roll? You mm-hmm. know, um, is, is there an established, am I picking something up that has an established style uh, do are they trying to do a time period or, or are they are they going after a particular sound and look um, or are they creating something from nothing mm-hmm. um, for instance I, I worked on this incredible show that I always plug because I just love 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 this writer I fell in love with this writer by reading all of her books and then I got on her show and I had to fangirl on her for 30 seconds and then be like, okay, now business. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really great. But um, it's a, a show called Made for Love on HBO Max, and mm-hmm. it, it's lovely. Um, but that was an environment that was kind of like a uh, the type of sci-fi that you can't tell whether it's happening right now or in the very near future. And so, and it's a little irreverent and it's a little... Uh, it's surprising in many ways. It's funny. It's kind of very quirky. The style was very hard to put, even after reading all the books and feeling her style, it was very hard to pin down. And it was something that had to be created. And so it was a very collaborative process. and was very experimental and it was so much fun. Um, meanwhile, um, things like Outlander, um, you want to embrace the style of the time period that they're in because the time period that that character is in is all about that story that creates, mm-hmm. that that is narratively important. So that's really more about accuracy and about detail of environment. So mm-hmm. it depends, it depends on the project. And so sometimes they can say, okay, well, clearly on Outlander, you make 1700 seven, mm-hmm. you, know. So, <laughs> you know, but on Made for Love, um, we had to have some kind of preliminarily, pre- preliminary conversations of this should feel like this, that should feel like this, and it got really fun, uh, especially towards the last season. We got really into pitch shifting and kind of personifying inanimate objects um, because we wanted the technology to feel kind of ever present and watching, like involved in what's actively That's happening, really cool. which is kind of cool. Did they give you any more time? You know, I will to say this. Explore like that. You I, know I, what I, mean? I, will, I will say this. Um, mm-hmm. Both Made for Love and Outlander. Um, I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't say they were generous, but they were very sufficient. They, 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 Good. Yeah, for what they were asking for, they were not ridiculous, and they were they were really, yeah, and they were collaborators. That's, that's a lot yeah. of times what we're I, fighting, that's right? Key. That's key. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people want a lot, and they don't have a lot, and mm-hmm. I get it. Again, I, I wouldn't want to be the person who is managing multiple disciplines or crafts. Right. Um, and I always find writers, uh, and especially uh, writer directors and, and writer producers as incredibly talented individuals because I consider myself a great elaborator, but I have no impetus of concept. I need to hear your concept to imagine off of it. Like that, sure. is, that is what I do. You know, So to meet these people that can come up with nothing and manifest it out of the ether. Uh, I feel them. I want to make their vision happen. There's nothing more frustrating than feeling their vision, knowing you can do it, knowing you're that person, wanting to make it happen, and then not having the resources to actually do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a, it's a continued, that's honestly the most frustrating yeah. thing about my job. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> right. That's a very hard conundrum to fix sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah. Like and, I mean, do. And, I, and it's got to be worse for them than me, mm-hmm. you know? Right. I'm only dealing with sound, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
So for the sound department, I kind of want to paint the picture. And we talked a little bit about this on our mm-hmm. initial call when we were talking through what we want to like discuss. I feel like not enough time is spent discussing what the sound department looks like as a whole. You mm-hmm. know, you see the credits in the movie and there's all of these people listed. Sure. And I would love to just like break that down to something that's easy to consume from production to post. Okay. Yeah. If that's... And talk about your team. Sure. So, so, uh, you know, I have two wonderful boom operators and, and, uh, Surgeon Popovich and, and, uh, Richard Geertz and, um, Christina Meyer has been our, 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 our third, at least on, on reboot. And, um, you know, before that, um, I stayed with Dan Leip for many years before he retired, but uh, these, these guys are, have been doing it for a very long time. They're very, very good boom operators meaning they're putting them, they're figuring out how to mic a situation, dodge lights, remember a lot of dialogue, especially on Modern Family and, 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 and Reboot. We're doing, you know, eight page scenes with mm-hmm. three cameras and, and the camera's moving. So they're having to, you know, jump over it or, or you know, boom through a tiny window. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a, a lot of times it, it's, it's, pretty spectacular to see them work they're they're very talented and then the um you know show creator or writer will come in and say oh this is not working for us so you're saying this you're saying this and you're saying this Mm -hmm. so all of a sudden the cues have all changed so my entire team is is going through okay you're going to cover this line you're going to cover that Mm -hmm. and i'll cover this on a wire and now christina you're going to have to come in and do 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 this line Mm -hmm. so that's that. That's the challenge of, of production. Um, so they're uh, nimble. Bo- booming mm-hmm. is, yeah. is 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 um, being able to uh, you know be flexible, change change quickly, and 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 you know get the mic in the right spot, mm-hmm. and not be in the frame. You know, because mm-hmm. then we have to go over, do it again. Right. Um, the utility is is usually wiring the actors so you know it's a big job it's res- a lot of responsibility to mm-hmm. to do that well mm-hmm. get all the settings right because actors don't like it when you go on take two and take three and take four and you're you're mm-hmm. futzing with them it it pulls them out mm-hmm. sometimes you're forced to you have to because you're not getting the scene you're working with other departments because uh, w- wardrobe uh, is 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 scratchy, <laughs> that that kind of thing. Or, you know, on Maggie, we had to get a. She had very cool costumes. They did a great job dressing the lead character, mm-hmm. and we'd have to figure out early on, um, you know, days before what would be the challenge of of that. Um, that that dress or you know in 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 the case of uh, one episode she was going to prom so we had to get um the the wi- the wires sewn into um to certain outfits or certain mm-hmm. jackets and that really really helped and um MJ our, our our third on that one um really did a good job did she have Stay. to watch, or, or did costuming her? Costuming did yeah. it, but, you know, facilitating it. Copy that. It's, it's yeah. such a team effort. So that's kind of what it mm-hmm. looks like. I go to the meetings and, and manage the department from, from, from that side and then um, make sure we have extra people as we need them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you're the mixer, right? I'm the mixer. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm taking all of the mics that are going through my mixing board. Mm-hmm. And going into the recorder. He's leaving that out. That's a big thing. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're designing our, mm-hmm. our, our, our gear per, per show, really. Mm-hmm. I, I mean. And what is the, do you have like a name of this product, this mixer? Oh. Uh, is it proprietary? No, no, no. It's a Yamaha 01V since mm-hmm. I got on Modern Family because the, prior to that, um, I was on a, a professional sound corp uh, m m8 mixer which was mm-hmm. eight eight channels but mm-hmm. that wasn't enough to accommodate the needs of what modern family was with a cast of 10 12 people regularly and then three booms mm-hmm. um so you know i changed out recorders on that show and and you know and then 
certain episodes you're like we did a dude ranch episode mm -hmm. and specifically for that i saw i needed faders not as many but we were going to uh we were in jackson hole wyoming at a at a dude ranch so it was really hard to get around that place mm -hmm. so i built kind of a small mini mixer um, um kit that i could you know ultimately take the um um, the recorder, the control surface, the wires, and so forth, and actually walk it across a field if I needed to, or up right. a mountain. 